And now it's time for five Final Fantasy fan theories that change everything. Get ready to have your world shaken. Disclaimer, these are fan theories. We are not saying they are correct. We are not saying they are incorrect. This is just for fun. Number five, Squall is dead. Final Fantasy VIII is one of the weirdest games I've ever played in my entire life. And to just be completely honest with you, I think that's just what it is. Super weird. But other people have taken to trying to explain the weirdness and some have come up with a fairly interesting theory. At the end of the first disc of the game, Squall and everybody face the sorceress Idea on a parade float. When they finally seem to defeat Idea, she uses magic to impale Squall with a massive ice spear. The theory states that from this point forward, Squall is simply experiencing a dream, a sort of end of life experience. Basically an extension of your life flashes before your eyes. And there's a pretty compelling bit of evidence. And that is that Final Fantasy VIII is one of the weirdest games I've ever played. And yes, I repeated that sentence in the exact same way I said it before for a reason. There are so many strange inconsistencies that are very conveniently explained as that's just how it is. Like all the characters sort of randomly growing up in an orphanage together. Or Renoa basically being in love with someone the exact opposite of Squall, Cypher would suddenly just basically forget about him and love Squall without really much prompting. Or Cypher going from a fairly complex character that you weren't sure whether was friend or foe to just a cackling bad guy. Then there's the ending, which is either the eternal sunshine of the spotless mind or an utterly purposeless acid trip that basically gets erased and everyone's okay. I don't know, I kind of look at this theory as mental gymnastics to make a game that doesn't make a lot of sense start to make sense. But it is well researched and at very least an interesting read. I don't know, what do you think? That's what the comments section is for anyway. Number four, Rufus Shinra is a good guy. There's a fan theory out there that the entire time during Final Fantasy VII, Rufus, the son of President Shinra, is actually helping Avalanche in subtle or even outright ways. Some people believe he actually killed his father with a sword that looks like Sephiroth's and let Cloud and company out of the prison rather than Sephiroth. The same people believe that he simply gave them a motive and continued to act the part of the bad guy to be present during important events and open up the possibility to help Avalanche or push them in a certain direction. There's actually a pretty fair amount of evidence for this, including how Rufus Shinra acts in Final Fantasy VII Advent Children, the CG movie sequel to Final Fantasy VII. The theory more concerns the idea that he was a good guy from the start, rather than between sometime the game and the film sequel, switch sides. I mean, how else would the key have ended up on Tifa's foot when they were gassing her? Pretty solid theory, to be honest. Number three, the fact Final Fantasy XIII is all corridors up until a certain point is actually intentional and linked to the themes of the game. Now, if you've ever played Final Fantasy XIII, you know how incredibly linear it is. Until you get to Grand Pulse, the game feels like a hallway. Some fans believe this is to make you feel the feelings the characters feel about their journey. They're forced into it. They have no choice. They have no other direction to take. Just forward, endlessly pursuing the exact same goal. Whereas, once they get to Grand Pulse, they start to realize that the sea aren't some lifeless monster doing the bidding of some other lifeless monster. They're people. They have choices. They have recourse. They can make changes to their fate if they really, truly want to. This is reflected in the opening up of the game itself. Grand Pulse kind of let you hop around and complete different objectives and missions. The idea is based somewhat on the concept of empathy, that you might identify with the characters better if you're feeling the same feelings that they are as the game progresses. Now, Square Enix has never actually made an official comment towards this, and there's no real reason to expect that they will. Detractors make the argument that it in fact was technical limitations that created the corridor-like nature of the game, and that Grand Pulse essentially being a really big field where you could repeat enemies and things like that made more sense to give you more free reign in than a city. I can't really say for certain whether I believe in the theory or not. I will say if the gameplay itself had that kind of purpose, it would make the game a bit deeper and more meaningful. And for the first long long section of Final Fantasy XIII that's kind of something that felt desperately lacking. Number two, the final tower before Kefka and Final Fantasy VI are actually the three stages of the Divine Comedy. The final tower has three levels, each of which can be interpreted as one of the books from the Divine Comedy. Level one being the Inferno. It's hard not to look at the boss as kind of Satan-like. The second level being Purgatory, with the boss consisting of a selection of random enemies mashed together which they're now stuck between Kefka's abomination between heaven and hell. 
Purgatory. The third level is the paradise, or to put it in Judeo-Christian terms, heaven. The symbolism of this boss is basically Mary, the mother of Jesus, resurrecting her son if he's killed with her tears. In fact, the Japanese version, the woman's head is actually named Mary, and Jesus is basically Kafka, which isn't a disturbing thought at all. And if you kill him, he shows up again, not necessarily on the third day, but resurrected nonetheless, above the tower. Playing into this mythology, one could say that the son dies, but the son is also the father. Anyway, above paradise is Kafka himself. He has now become a god. His appearance is actually pretty similar to Lucifer as described in literature. If you've never really thought of it this way, I basically accept this as fact. Japanese game developers tend to really love to borrow from other religions to create their own mythology within their games, particularly those who create role-playing games. This fits in perfectly with that design ethos. And number one is a theory that all of the Final Fantasy games are actually connected in a tightly knitted multiverse, and that Final Fantasy XIV is at the very center. Final Fantasy XIV repeats a lot of key elements of the entire series mythology in a way that structures its world as sort of an amalgamation of many other Final Fantasy worlds. And then there's Final Fantasy IV The After Years, which basically flat out says that the first four games are definitely connected. Then of course there's Dissidia Final Fantasy, which two gods grab have various heroes and villains from Final Fantasy to fight as champions in a mirror dimension, with the ultimate prize being their own universe. This actually hints at the idea that these universes are connected and the doors can be opened between them. Side note, I don't really know how seriously you take the city of Final Fantasy, and if it's not very, that's perfectly fine. There's other evidence. Gilgamesh from Final Fantasy V gets banished into quote-unquote the void. The Gilgamesh we see in every further entry of Final Fantasy is the same Gilgamesh. It's even rumored that if you properly translated Final Fantasy VIII into English, he actually asks Squall if he is Bart's. This creates an actually pretty strong case for the idea that all these worlds are connected in some way. And then there's the fact that Final Fantasy X is actually a very, very, very distant prequel to Final Fantasy VII. There's actually a character named Shinra in Final Fantasy X who expresses that he has thought of a way to pull energy out of the planet. It's believed that there are many, many generations in between the two, but that Spira and the planet are actually the same place. Add that into the idea that the summons might actually just be dimensional rifts that bring in various incarnations of different characters, gods, monsters, monsters, whatever you want to call a summon. And the Final Fantasy multiverse theory is actually not insane. There are indications in quite a few of the games that all but confirm this. And even if it's bullshit, man, it's fun bullshit, isn't it? Anyway, if you happen to have a crazy theory about Final Fantasy, spend as long as you can typing it out in as much detail as you can in a way that's bound to piss somebody else off in the comments. What I'm saying there is that fan theories are often a source of controversy, but we're interested in them nonetheless. If you enjoyed this video or indeed any of our videos, please do us a favor and click the like button. Also, if you're new to Game Ranks, you're going to want to hit that subscribe button because every single day we upload new videos and that's the easiest way to see them first. We hope you enjoyed this and we thank you very much for watching it. We will see you next time here at Game Ranks.